and welcome to Scholars Hub at Home. My name is Joanne Hui. I am the Alumni and Events Officer at the Faculty of Environmental and Urban Change at York University. Thank you for joining us for today's lecture, Be the Change, with Dr. Sheila Kola, Associate Professor in the Faculty of Environmental and Urban Change, and Dr. Amro Zayed, Professor in the Faculty of Science. I accept the responsibility to acknowledge the land that I am on. Because we are all not gathered in the same place, the land that I am about to acknowledge might not be for the territory that you are on. Please take the responsibility to acknowledge the traditional territory you're on. The website native-land.ca is a great resource for this. As a member of the York University community, I recognize that many Indigenous nations have long-standing relationships with the territories upon which York University campuses are located that precede, precede the establishment of York University. York University acknowledges its presence on the, on the traditional territory of many Indigenous nations. The area known as Takaranto has been caretaken by the Anishinaabek Nation, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, and the Huron-Wendat. It is home to many First Nation, Inuit, and Métis communities. We acknowledge the current treaty holders, the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. This territory is subject of the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, an agreement to peacefully share the land and care for the Great Lakes region. Before we introduce our speakers today, I'm excited to tell you that York is strengthening its position as a leader in creating sustainable and inclusive world, placing in the top 35 post-secondary institutions in the respected Times Higher Education Impact Rankings. Find out what is happening at York by reading our monthly newsletter, York U Alumni News. If you don't already subscribe, you can update your contact information on our website, which is yorku.ca slash alumni and friends. Now we'd like to conduct a quick poll before each of our lectures. Today's question is, how would you rate your knowledge regarding the topic of today's presentation? Um, a poll will pop up on screen right now and I'll give everyone a moment to respond. So let us know about your knowledge on pollinators, the status on in Canada, We'd love to hear. Give a couple more minutes. Let's see what the results are. Great, so we have a majority of folks that are on the call today that are somewhat informed or highly informed of the topic. So we're excited to have you. And for those that are new to this topic or know little, uh, we're excited to uh, engage you in the conversation and, and, and have you here with us. Now, uh, if you ever need help with our Zoom webinar, uh, feel free to click on the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Um, our team is ready to help you. That same button can also be used to submit questions for our guest speakers to answer during the Q&A period following today's presentation. Please note that all of your questions and comments are visible to our panelists and the staff working behind the scenes. We ask that you keep your comments relevant and respectful. Now, without further ado, I'd like to welcome Alice Horvorka, the Dean of the Faculty of Environmental and Urban Change, to give some updates from our faculty. Dean Horvorka, it's a pleasure to have you here with us. Thank you so much, Joanne. And uh, greetings from the Faculty of Environmental and Urban Change, or EUC, at York University. I'm also wanting to send greetings from my colleague, Dean Bree Wang, from the Faculty of Science. And we, we see uh, ourselves co-hosting this event. Um, and welcome to this exciting event featuring two of our exceptional scientific researchers, Dr. Sheila Kola and Dr. Amro Zayed, as we celebrate World Bee Day. This is a moment for all of us to reflect on our relationship with bees and other facets of nature upon which we so fundamentally rely. It is also a moment to reflect on the lives of bees themselves and their fundamental right to exist and thrive on the planet. Our global efforts to slow biodiversity loss have proved challenging. Uh, the United Nations decade uh, old plan to slow down and eventually stop the decline of species and ecosystems by 2020 has not quite been realized. This UN Convention on Biological Diversity has recently been reestablished as the post-2020 Global Biodiversity Framework, or GBF, with new, new targets uh, expected to be agreed upon this summer at the Convention's Conference of the Parties, or COP15. 
A draft uh, GBF was published last July, and it notes an aspirational goal that by 2050, biodiversity will be, quote, valued, conserved, restored, and wisely, wisely used, maintaining ecosystem services, sustaining a healthy planet, and delivering benefits to uh, essential for all people, and I would argue for the planet as well. So it's within this context that our Faculty of Environmental and Urban Change was recently established at York University as a call to action to respond to some of the pressing challenges facing people in the planet, such as biodiversity loss. Our efforts are focused on producing and mobilizing knowledge for a just and sustainable world. As part of these efforts, we have joined together with the Faculty of Science to launch a new Bachelor of Science in Environmental Sciences. Within this program, students learn to understand, prevent, and solve environmental challenges such as biodiversity loss, pollution, erosion, climate change, and extreme weather events. They will gain scientific, technical, and analytical skills grounded in lab and field-based experiential learning to create practical solutions to the complex issues that we face. This is an exciting new undergraduate program at York U, and together with our highly acclaimed graduate programs at the Faculty of Science and our Faculty of Environmental and Urban Change, they focus on environmental literacy and bold action as a means of preparing the next generation of scientists and environmental leaders. And today we are highlighting another exciting collaboration between the Faculty of Science and EUC, the recently launched Center for Bee Ecology, Evolution and Conservation at York University. BC is an initiative that strives to advance research in the fields of bee ecology, evolution and conservation, and their goal is to apply this to the development of policies and environmental management for the long-term sustainability of bees and, vital, and the vital ecosystem services they provide. Without further ado, I will turn things over to Carolyn Davies, coordinator of BC and the moderator of today's scholarly, Scholars Hub to introduce our esteemed scientists. And I wish you all a wonderful event. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dean and Borka. Really appreciate those wonderful words. Uh, it is my pleasure to be able to introduce a little bit about um, our researchers that are joining us today. So Dr. Sheila Kula is York University's Research Chair in Interdisciplinary Conservation Science and an Associate Professor in the Faculty of Environmental and Urban Change. Dr. Kola's research focuses on understanding the ecology and status of wild pollinators, primarily bumblebees. She recently received the 2021 C. Gordon Hewitt Award from the Entomological Society of Canada for her international leadership in the conservation of pollinators. Her research team investigates questions which fill knowledge gaps directly related to the conservation management of at-risk species and have recently begun to investigate the human dimension of pollinator conservation. And this includes stakeholder perspectives, citizen science, and incorporating biocultural knowledge systems. Dr. Kola is the North American coordinator for the IUCN Red List Species Specialist Group, which aims to understand the status of bumblebees globally. She is also co-author of the Bumblebee of North America, an identification guide, and a new book being launched next month titled A Garden for the Rusty Patched, Creating Habitat for Native Pollinators in Southern Ontario. Welcome, Sheila. Also joining us today is Dr. Amra Zayed, who is York University's Research Chair in Genomics and a Professor in the Biology Department at the Faculty of Science. Dr. Zayed's research focuses on the genetics, genomics, and behavior of social insects using the honeybee as a model organism. Using genomics, applied tools are also being developed in his BCSI project to improve honeybee health and to understand the causes and consequences of population decline in native bees such as bumblebees. Zayed has received over $21 million in research funding since 2009 from a variety of sources, including Genome Canada, Ontario Genomics, NSERC, and the Ontario Ministry of Research and Innovation. He was also recently awarded with the Canadian Foundation for Innovation, John R. Evans Leader uh, Fund to uh, develop a research apiary on the Keele campus at York University. 
Thank you very much for joining us, both of you. I'd like to now welcome uh, Dr. Sheila Kola to tell us a little bit more about her research and about bees. Thank you. All right. <clears throat> so I've been studying bees for about 20 years now. Um, during my undergrad, I was placed in a lab that studied bumblebee behavior inside flight cages inside a lab. And through that early exposure, I learned not to be scared of bees. Uh, before that, I thought wasps were bees. I grew up in the city. Bees were only bad. Um, and then also through that, I started noticing that species that we were supposed to have in Toronto and um, in southern Ontario uh, were missing. So after my undergrad, I approached Dr. Lawrence Packer, who's a professor um, in biology here at York University, to do a PhD to try to figure out why some of these species seem to have just disappeared because no one was talking about it, no one was researching it. Um, and that research, my PhD work, ended up being some of the first work to quantitatively document the decline of native bees um, in North America. And it sort of happened around the same time that colony collapse disorder hit uh, the managed bee industry in the U.S., uh, which then put bee declines on the public's radar. So it's been really interesting to work um, on this environmental issue for so long, um, it, and it, it went from being relatively obscure to on the radar of the general public and policymakers. Um, one of the first, one of the species I focused my research on is the rusty patch bumblebee. Some of you may have heard of it. Um, it was the first bee to become listed as endangered in both Canada and the US. Uh, the rusty patch bumblebee was one of the most common species in Southern Ontario. Um, in the 70s, if you saw 100 bumblebees in a field, about 15 of them would have been the rusty patch bumblebee, uh, but it's disappeared through most of its range, um, including Southern Ontario and Eastern North America. It seems to have declined, uh, started declining sometime in the 90s, and it hasn't been seen in Canada since I found it at Pine Ridge Provincial Park on the shores of Lake Huron in 2009. So for that species, we think the main cause of this decline was an introduced disease from the managed bee industry. Um, and it's been a bit of a race against time to try to figure out you know, how we can support this species um, and other species, which are also at risk of extinction. I've been really lucky to be able to work with amazing colleagues, not only here at York with the Bee Research Unit, um, but also in other universities with NGOs and government agencies across Canada, the US and Mexico as well. Um, and working in this space in this research area has made me realize more and more the importance of inter interdisciplinary research. So while my academic training is in ecology and field biology, I've had to branch out into environmental policy analysis, um, engage citizens into community science, citizen science. I've had to understand stakeholder engagement and perceptions, uh, public understanding and how that influences uh, policy and other sorts of disciplines which center humans more explicitly. So while it's much more fun to walk in fields of flowers and look for rare species of bees than to work with humans, um, I realized pretty quickly that if I want my research to make an impact in the real world, to leave the ivory tower, then I actually needed to do this kind of work in order to be able to contextualize this environmental issue within a, a complex sociocultural system. So some examples of sort of the more social uh, components of my research now uh, with my lab include uh, developing a national pollinator strategy framework for Canada, um, developing some best practices for uh, managed bee diseases to make sure they don't impact our other wild bee species the way the rusty patch bumblebee was, um, and a, a project called Finding Flowers with Professor Lisa Myers, who's another professor um, in EUC. Um, and I think I'll try to share some of the links because they're all kind of large projects. So maybe I'll try to share some links in the chat while we're discussing um, but I'm happy to answer any questions. And with that, I'll hand it off to Amro. Thank you so much, Sheila. And uh, I, I want to say thank you to the organizer for uh, for hosting this event and, and for allowing us to this opportunity to kind of uh, talk to people about a topic that we're very passionate about with bees and, and how we could uh, make them uh, healthier and, and have more of them. So uh, yeah, I also uh, uh, kind of started my career around a similar time as, as Sheila, this, uh, this time where like, you know, 
bees were declining, what the hell is happening, <laughs> why and, and, and how. So uh, I did my PhD actually at York University with the Professor Lawrence Packer. Uh, and my PhD was on the conservation genetics of, uh, of native bees, actually. So I started my career being a native bee biologist, uh, running around in people's uh, backyards and, and collecting uh, samples of bees that look like this from, from Toronto. This is Agapospomins, uh, the, the Toronto's bee, Agapospomins virescence. And uh, the, the goal of my PhD research was to kind of understand uh, bees have some unique genetic quirks. They, their males have one set of chromosomes versus the females have two, and they have a really unusual sex determination uh, system. And I wanted to see whether that these quirks kind of have an, uh, a role to play in their conservation. And actually we, we discovered that, that, that because of the weird sex determination system, uh, bees in general are way more susceptible to kind of population decline. So they're, they're intrinsically more susceptible to kind of going extinct because of the genetics. Uh, it's just kind of uh, sad and, and makes, makes uh, kind of early efforts to conserve uh, bees really important because once, once they go down to a certain population level, they could just spiral to extinction really quickly. And then for my postdoc, I actually went to Illinois, uh, to the University of Illinois, uh, the honeybee genome was being sequenced. The uh, honeybee genome, uh, honeybee is a managed species for uh, agricultural pollination in, in North America and, and other parts of the world. And they were the first bee to kind of, uh, to get their genome sequenced. So the first uh, sequencing of uh, the A, C, G, and T that make up the, the cookbook uh, that instructs the cell to make a honeybee. And uh, I was kind of excited about this uh, new business called genomics and I wanted to learn it. Uh, so I went to Illinois with the idea of learning the tools so I could apply, to, uh, I could apply them to native bees and, and native bee conservation. Uh, but I actually uh, kind of fell in love with the honeybee system. The honeybees are highly social. They have some really unique behavior and they're obviously very important for, for pollination. So I decided to kind of shift my focus a little bit to uh, studying the evolution of honeybees. Uh, and using genetics and genomics, or genomics is when you sequence entire the entire molecules of DNA in, in individuals or, or colonies. So trying to use that technique to kind of understand how the bee evolved, how, how the bee was became social, but also if we could exploit this new technology to make honeybees uh, healthier, to manage honeybees better, and then. As time kind of uh, went by, I'm, I'm starting to kind of go back to my original roots and, and thinking about how to apply this technology of uh, genome sequencing to conserving native pollinators. Uh, so we, we have a couple of very exciting uh, projects, including some co collaboration with, uh, with Dr. Uh, Kola here, uh, where we're trying to uh, use genomics to as a kind of a playing doctors with bees. You know, so when we get sick, we go to the doctor, they run a battery of tests on us and they say, you have X, Y, and Z. And what a big problem with pollination conservation and bee conservation is that we don't know why bees are declining, right? Uh, because we, we don't have a lot of good diagnostic tools. Uh, so by sequencing genomes and by seeing which genes are getting turned on and off in specific tissues, we're actually getting to, uh, to the point where we can play doctor with bees and, and get samples from the field and infer what, uh, what are the pathogens or stressors or you know, agrochemicals or poor nutrition uh, that, uh, that is stressing out individuals and, and populations that could be contributing to the decline. So very, very exciting uh, field of uh, uh, using molecular and, and you know, genomics to kind of diagnose why native as well as managed bees are declining. Thank you both of you for uh, outlining a little bit more about your research and your expertise. Um, now, we all know that the, uh, the research outcomes are extremely important to discuss and to consider, but both Sheila and Emma wanted to make sure that everyone joining us today had an opportunity to ask questions about bees, ask questions to help understand uh, a little bit more about what are the declining issues, um, what are the, um, the threats associated with bees, what are actually happening out there. So we're now going to be uh, entering into our Q&A portion of our event. Uh, for all the attendees joining us today, please submit your questions into the Q&A box that can be found along the bottom of your screen, and that's if you're joining us from Zoom. If you are joining us by Facebook, you can also submit your questions uh, in the uh, comment session at the bottom. 
of your screen there or at the bottom of the box on Facebook. Uh, so just basically to start us off, uh, I'm going to ask one question for both Sheila and Amro. Uh, just a little bit, because uh, I know this is a really complex uh, question, uh, about the status of wild and managed bees right now and what are the main threats? Amro, do you want to go first? <laughs> Sure, maybe, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll speak to kind of manage, uh, manage honeybees. And so uh, we, we kind of know the, the usual suspects. So the usual suspects, well, we call them the, the four Ps. So that's uh, uh, pests, uh, parasites, uh, pesticides, and, and poor nutrition. Uh, so it's, it's, uh, it, that's kind of what the general consensus is. Now, it's very difficult to kind of apply this knowledge in, in any kind of meaningful way because that, that's kind of like a, a laundry list of, of things. And that's really an area where we need to do better as, as researchers uh, to, to provide beekeepers with, with better diagnostic tools because you know, they, you know, there, there are multiple pesticides, there are multiple pathogens. And, and we need to be able to go in quickly and understand, you know, okay, yes, you have this virus, and that pesticide, and, and yes, you have like a poor uh, pollen uh, uh, nutritional uh, uh, kind of resources and, and, and give beekeepers some actionable like uh, list of stressors that they could manage. Uh, we also, a, a big problem is that we don't understand how the multiple stressors interact and, and lead to kind of synergistic effects or, or uh, effects that, uh, combine and lead to health outcomes that are far worse than if you were to uh, expose bees to the individual stressors on their own. So that's in general what we're kind of thinking about in terms of uh, the health of managed uh, honeybees. Well, thank you. All right, so in terms of, um, sorry, wild bee communities, um, actually we don't really know too much. So in Canada, there's about 865 native bee species. I work on bumblebees, which are the best known. Um, there's about 45 species of bumblebees in Canada. Most people think there's like one. Um, so when we think about the bumblebees, which is just a short, a small subsection of the larger bee community, um, about a quarter to a third of them are at risk of extinction. So we could probably guess that maybe a quarter to a third of like the wild bees as a community might be at risk of extinction, but we just don't have enough baseline data to understand um, current survey work. Um, some of these species are so hard to identify, which is why people like Amro, uh, sorry, not, well, Amro, you can ID your bees pretty well, but um, Sandra and Lawrence, who really focus on species identification and lab work, uh, why they're so important. Um, we're, we're still even discovering new species. I think Lawrence has a whole drawer of species that are just waiting to be named. Um, so there's definitely a, like a taxonomic barrier there, and it's really hard to, to study wild animals, um, but for the bumblebees, um, that's what we think about a quarter to a third of them are at risk of extinction, and some seem to have declined very rapidly, and some seem to be declining kind of more slowly over time. This question actually is uh, for you again, Sheila. Could you speak more about how it is believed that managed bee disease is the primary cause of Bombus aphanus uh, decline? And uh, is that suspected as a primary cause for other bee declines as well? Yeah, so unfortunately, it's really hard to study the rescue patch bumblebee because it declined so rapidly. And like I've only seen two individuals um, since studying them since say 2005. So um, it, it means you need to sort of take multiple lines of evidence and study all sorts of different possible factors to try to describe the declines that we're seeing. Uh, so um, when you think about the extent of decline, the species has declined from Southern Ontario, Southern Quebec, all the way down to Georgia, west of the Dakotas. And even within that range, there's a lot of protected areas like the Appalachian Mountains and it declined from um, there as well. Uh, so things like habitat loss or pesticide use don't really describe the declines that we that we see over such a large landscape. Um, so we think either um, climate change or pathogens probably can describe something that that large scale. Uh, some work that we did um, together with AMRO showed um, in a closely related species, Bombus tricola, which is also a species in decline. There's some evidence that the immune function was um, activated or um, that we can sort of 
think that it might also be susceptible to pesticides based on sort of where it was um, where it was found and the cool genomic and uh, genetic tools that AMRO has access to. Um, and then there's also some research that we've done using GIS to look at where managed bees are used and where um, wild bees have wild species have declined, and we can kind of guess based on that as well, that it might be one of the main uh, reasons for decline. So it's really, when once a species is almost gone, it's really hard to pinpoint why it disappeared, um, but we sort of are pulling together all of these different um, lines of evidence. Thank you very much. I guess the second part of that question was, is that also um, the reason for other species to be in decline? So. Um, there are also like um, the yellow banded bumblebee and the American bumblebee are also at risk of extinction. And there is also some evidence that disease is um, one of the main threats to those populations as well. But there are probably other things at play like um, pesticide use and habitat loss and climate change as well. This question, I believe, is for both of you. Uh, do you feel that native bees and managed honeybees can coexist in a way that is economically sustainable? And how do you think we can get there? Uh, uh, maybe, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll start first. I, I think certainly there, there, there is lots of room for. Uh, for managed bees and and uh, and, and native bees to to coexist and uh, uh, it's uh, uh, it, it's it's important to know that they are different things and 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 obviously native bees are are native managed bees are introduced for uh, pollination uh, they do require resources there is uh, there's been a lot of studies and and there is uh, well as far maybe maybe Sheila will correct me but there's still kind of uh, a lot of research that needs to kind of be done to understand how honeybees uh, compete with resources with with other native bees uh, is it is it a general phenomena that affects the entire community or is it just kind of restricted to competition between a few uh, natives and, and honeybees uh, but certainly I, I think there's you know there there is room to to exist and, and certainly more research needs to be done but uh, uh, I think there are ways we could we could have honeybees to uh, to use in, in industrial agriculture and still have native bees uh, and, and conserve native bees. So I'll, I'll, I'll pass it on to, to Sheila. Yeah, like I agree with Amro on all of that. Um, there are just some things that we could do to make um, it a little bit more sustainable, the management of bees. So thinking about things like limiting densities in places maybe where they have, where there are rare species, rare bee species that uh, occur close by. Um, and, you know, sometimes people just kind of have a hive and they throw it in their backyard or on top of their roof because they think that they're helping the environment. So kind of steering away from that kind of thing, because those are not like professional beekeepers who are checking on their bees and taking care of diseases as they as they occur. Um, it's kind of a misdir misdirected approach to helping the bees. Um, so really focusing on where we need honeybees for pollination in order to have um, the adequate crop pollination, but not using managed bees outside of those areas if we don't need them. So there are a few ways that we can sort of tweak things to make things more sustainable. And, and maybe I'll, I'll just jump on quickly that I, I totally agree with, with uh, Sheila's point that, uh, uh, you know, we, we do have laws that prevent people from putting uh, honeybees in, in their backyard. And, and given, you know, that we're coming off probably one of the worst years of for honeybee mortality, it's really difficult to kind of keep honeybees healthy. And if you don't keep honeybees healthy, uh, you could spread a lot of diseases to other managed colonies and as well as to the other pollinators. So uh, I, I think I think if, if you're considering, you know, putting a honeybee colony in, in your yard just to save to save bees, then that's probably uh, kind of well, it's not probably, but that's definitely not like the, uh, the right approach here because honeybees are not endangered in, in Canada. So there are many other ways. And I think we'll, we'll touch upon that to kind of make your, your home more uh, pollinator friendly. Uh, but th there is a serious danger to getting a honeybee colony and just kind of having some fun. It requires a lot of training. And, and, and honestly, I, I, I think like, unless you're planning to have 
uh, you can't just you can't like learn anything from managing a single honeybee colony you need to have like multiple bees to understand what's normal what's not normal so i, I think there are many honey excellent honeybee keepers in ontario and, and i think that you should we should leave our honeybees in, the, in their capable hand because there is many many things that could go wrong and and you might be going in with good intentions and you know you have uh, uh, your colony develops fowl brood and you wouldn't know because you, you you didn't take a course and all of a sudden you've infected many colonies in the nearby with like a danger uh, dangerous and nasty uh, disease so I, I prefer if if uh, there are many other things that you can do to save pollinators and 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 I, I wouldn't uh, I wouldn't recommend anybody to just dabble into beekeeping without doing some serious uh, training and and uh, and you know it, it's a it's a commitment and, and you're responsible for like the lives of these bees and, and you want to do the best that you can to learn and get uh, receive training and, and do it properly so your bees will live and you don't infect nearby colonies and nearby native uh, native pollinators great tip Samra. thank you very much uh, we're going to switch directions a little bit here uh, there's a question on where is canada on neonicotinoids yeah, maybe. So we, we were we were expecting a phase up, but uh, recently in, in 2012, uh, uh, there's been an, a, another uh, re-review of, of the evidence, and now uh, uh, neonicotinoids are still kind of allowed to be used. There are stricter conditions for their use, but unfortunately, they're they're not going to be phased up as uh, uh, as the decision was the uh, Health Canada's decision in, in 2018. Great question for Sheila. Uh, is there any value in not mowing my lawn in May? Are dandelions beneficial for bees? Yeah, so this is a hot topic. It always is in the month of May these days. Um, so I would say that, you know, um, having dandelions is better than having just grass or having concrete. Um, I personally advocate for trying to incorporate native plants as much as possible. So rather than um, just thinking about the month of May and letting some dandelions bloom um, to actually set aside maybe a little part of your yard and plant native plants. And if you can't do that, maybe a flowering shrub, you know, which has hundreds of flowers. So even just one shrub or tree can actually like give so much more nectar pollen than a few dandelions growing for a month. Um, there's some evidence that dandelion pollen is not the like healthiest pollen for a wild bees. It's an invasive um, non-native species. Um, it has something called allelopathic pollen. So um, it means it the pollen once if it's deposited onto like adjacent other species of plants, um, it can actually affect the pollination of those plants as well, which is part of why it's such a successful invader. Um, it also has really low protein. So there was a study on bumblebee queens that fed um, the bumblebee queens just dandelion, just willow, or just um, apple or, or prunus pollen. And the queens that were only fed dandelion were so pollen deprived, they actually ate their own eggs and didn't have any reproductives. So while it is a, a good like nectar source, um, there are definitely better nectar and pollen sources out there. So we do try to advocate as much as possible people focusing on native plants that our native bees have co-evolved with. And also, I guess the part about mowing the lawn, um, bees and other critters use leaf litter and tall grass and all of these things year round. Um, there are some bees that will only emerge in June, some bees that will emerge in July and August. So while you might be helping some of the spring emergent species by just thinking about May, um, <clears throat> it's kind of more important to think about supporting the things that use all of this sort of messy yard type material throughout the entire year. So try to keep things as messy as possible for as many months as possible, not just in May. And this may be a great opportunity to plug your new book um, for anyone looking to replace their dandelions or their lawn with something that blooms. Uh, that is native and is a great resource. Um, so it, her new book is A Garden for the Rusty Patch and it's creating habitat for native pollinators in Southern Ontario. So if you are in Southern Ontario, it could be a really great resource so that you could find out 
you know, what's blooming right now. I know in my lawn, it's, or in my yard, it's the service berry has just finished blooming. So again, there's loads of opportunities to find out um, what kind of plants you could put there instead. Uh, Amro, our next question is for you. Uh, is there a maximum density of honeybee hives that could be considered safe to avoid harmful competition with native bees? Yeah, that, that, that's an excellent question. And, and I think it's, it's something that uh, is part of the research that needs to uh, be done to uh, figure out what, you know, when are honeybees bad and when are honeybees uh, you know, not bad or have no, no influence on, on, on native pollinators. Uh, obviously, dennis, density of colonies makes sense, right? That the more honeybee colonies that you have, uh, the more bees, uh, the more honeybees that you have that are kind of competing for resources over, you know, three kilometer radius. Uh, so I, I'm actually not aware of, of a study that has empirically looked at the effects of density. Uh, common sense suggests that the lower the density, the lesser the effect, uh, but I, I'm not aware of that. Sheila, are you aware of like a, a, a density study? Um, I mean, I think there might have been some, but I, I can't think of the results at the top of my head. Uh, it, it will also kind of depend on the environment as well, right? If, if you're in a nutritional desert, then the density uh, would be smaller than if you have a lot of uh, plant resources. But it's it's a very interesting question, but unfortunately, I don't think we, uh, we have a good answer for it yet. A bit of a follow-up, uh, considering um, those companies that offer uh, basically beehive hosting in your backyard, um, the, where the company provides everything, including actual, you know, taking care of the bees and medicating and that kind of thing. Um, just wondering if you consider this exploitation of bees. This is part of the question. Um, if this is helping bees, uh, just your comments on how these companies um, are really impacting uh, bees, especially in urban settings. Yeah, I, I'll I'll quickly jump in. I'm, I admit, perhaps Sheila will will fall off later, but uh, yeah, I've 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 only seen and actually physically visited one of these kind of uh, you know managed by a company colonies, and they were not healthy bees. Uh, so I I I I wonder if. I just wonder what the kind of the motivation is, right? Because if you're just in it for the honey, you could buy honey from local beekeepers at farmer's market or, or at your grocery store. Uh, so uh, why have bees that you're not going to keep? Uh, because one more one more honeybee colony in on the roof of somewhere in Toronto is not going to save bees, right? It's it's so I, I, I really wonder what the motivation is. Uh, uh, if it's just for honey, because it seems like if, if you're just going to have a colony on a roof managed by somebody else, uh, well, you, you're, you're going to be benefit from the honey, but you could easily just buy local honey from beekeepers. So uh, it's questionable whether these companies are, are able to kind of manage, uh, effectively manage uh, colonies and, and kind of prevent disease. So I'm, 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 not, I'm not in favor of, of just uh, uh, having people do the hard work to kind of keep colonies because you know again your honeybees are livestock you're you're responsible for their health and because it's important that we keep them healthy because they they can like they can spread mites and, and pathogens to nearby colonies and, and native pollinators so i i would want to kind of be involved and and again you know i I, th I think for for most people that are interested in just kind of conserving bees there are so many better uh, ways you could uh, utilize resources or put your energy into uh, and and leave the beekeeper leave the beekeeping to the professionals essentially yeah another thing to keep in mind is just like the the biology of honeybees like they are in these very large hives between 10 and 50,000 individuals for our wild bees, like the largest bumblebee hive would maybe have like 200 individuals. And honeybees don't sleep in the winter like our native bees do. So that's why they make honey. They're collecting extra resources in the summertime to store food for the winter, whereas all of our native bees just sleep for the winter. Um, so they do take a lot more nectar and pollen out of um, an area than our native bees do for that reason. Um, they also have the waggle dance, which is a very cool thing, but it also means that they can communicate with each other and tell each other where the best um, food sources are. So if there's like one good tree in a neighborhood, like they can actually like communicate with their, their colony and like they can all go and, and forage off that tree. 
Whereas as far as we know for our native bees, there isn't that kind of communication. Uh, bumblebees uh, memorize landscapes on the ground and maybe use some pheromones to like communicate with each other, but there isn't that same like, hey everyone, let's go get this one tree kind of thing. Uh, so they're a little bit less competitive in that way. So there's so much more to understand. Uh, there's so much research to do, uh, but it's clear from the fact that like honeybees have been, been introduced to many countries and are very successful invaders that there's a lot of things we need to sort of uh, be aware of and, and be cautious about. Basically what we're learning, what we're trying to share with everyone is uh, honey beehives should be kept to um, the professionals. Um, even if the professionals want to come into your backyard, maybe that's not the most appropriate situation in order to be helping bees. Um, so thinking about all the different species of bees in our area, what are some things that individuals can do to help increase the bee population beyond no mow maize? All right, so the number one thing that I tell people that they can do to help is to um, participate in community science projects. So I help run Bumblebee Watch, which is a free uh, phone app or website, um, but it's been amazing that um, people have sent us photos of, and we've been able to find rare populations of species. We've been tracking invasive species. Uh, we've been collecting evidence to submit to governments around how they should be worried about, you know, certain bees um, escaping out of their ranges through um, greenhouses. Um, and it's, it's giving us a ton of data over many years that we can then use to analyze in terms of trying to predict um, climate change effects and pesticide use and all sorts of like really cool landscape stuff. So the number one way people can help is definitely uh, participating in community science. And then of course, planting native plants or encouraging your local business association uh, for your township or, or your uh, city riding or whatever um, to plant native plants, to support native trees. Um, and that kind of thing. Even if you have a balcony, um, in our book, we talk about different types of gardens, including like balcony garden, gardening, um, but anywhere where we can fit in native plants, um, that would be very helpful as well. Making sure you have things blooming all the way from the spring to the autumn, into the fall. So what you're saying is that everyone can really be the change just by planting some native plants and maybe talking to some other people about planting native plants. And that's really exciting, really sort of convenient way that everyone can get involved in supporting our native bees. So which types of our non sort of honeybee bees um, are most under threat and um, which ones are sort of susceptible to honeybee diseases and pathogens? All right, Emma, did you want to take that? My computer kind of just glitched there. Emma, you're on mute. Yeah, I, actually, if, if you want to take it, I, I, I think that would be better. <laughs> <laughs> All right, say that again, Carolyn. Absolutely. Uh, which types of bees are most under threat, like not honeybees, uh, but are susceptible to honeybee diseases and pathogens? Uh, so we actually don't really know how novel diseases will impact different species. We do have evidence that a single disease will affect different species differently. Um, so if you look at bumblebees in the UK, uh, when there was an introduced disease, some of them declined, some of them were fine. Um, some of them, you know, did even better for whatever reason, but um, it's really something that's hard to predict. And I think now that we're living through this COVID pandemic, I think people are kind of appreciating that, that new diseases um, that are exposed to species that have no, not co-evolved with them can have, you know, no effect or a really awful effect. Um, and we've seen it with all sorts of other taxa. So it's not something that we can predict, unfortunately. So the best thing to do is just minimize new, new diseases coming in and, and exposing um, species to them. Um, yeah, and in terms of like honeybee viruses, there's some recent studies that show that they can transfer to other species of bees, but also to hoverflies. So it might not even just be bees that we're talking about, it could be other um, wildlife taxa as well. Um, so yeah, so much work to be done in terms of like disease dynamics in the wild. Thank you very much. Amro, uh, we 
know there has been an increase in the use of pesticides in agriculture. What do you think about the increased use of fungicides and the impact that has had on honeybees as well as the native bees and other pollinators? Yeah, we're 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 actually studying this. Uh, there's been there's been uh, it, it's difficult to actually. Yeah, we, we we are not sure what the background use is because there just hasn't been a lot of uh, uh, surveys on on pesticides. So we're, I think we're actually probably uh, doing the first kind of large scale survey of pesticides in in Canadian honeybees. Uh, the results, uh, the preliminary results are going to be up very soon on uh, bcsi.ca. So BCSI is a large Genome Canada funded project where we're trying to develop tools to understand uh, uh, diagnose stressors in, in honeybee colonies. And it, part of that research included looking at uh, up to 220 different pesticides in a very large number of colonies uh, across Canada uh, in different crop systems, so far and away from agriculture, and you know that the list of the list of compounds in a honeybee colony is large, right? We're we're talking about 20, 30, 40 different pesticides uh, that includes insecticides, fungicides, herbicides, as well as miticides, and certainly the, the uh, you know fungicides are really common. They're they're commonly used. We, we're not because we don't have the data. We don't know whether their use has increased, but certainly they're, they're, they're common compounds. Uh, so what I'm concerned about is, is possible interactions, right? So if, uh, uh, you know, we, we're, we're familiar with this, right? If you pick up a prescription from uh, Shoppers Drug Mark, usually there's like a little, like, don't take this, uh, don't take this medicine if you're on another medicine, because, uh, you know, sometimes the two medicines on their own are okay, but when combined, you know, you could have a, a much more adverse reaction, right? With OD. Uh, and we're not, we're, certainly some of this must also be going on with honeybees, but it, it's an area where it's a total black box. When, when, you're, when you're testing a new pesticide uh, to determine whether it's safe on honeybees and, and other pollinators, you usually just test it on its own. But bees are never exposed to just one thing, right? They're exposed to 20 30 things, and, and we're interested that as uh, whether this cocktail of agrochemicals is leading to some negative effects that are uh, that are leading bees to kind of become smaller over time, the colonies to shrink over time and, and possibly not survive the winter. So it, it's certainly something that we're, we're concerned about this, uh, the number of agrochemicals that we're detecting and their potential uh, interaction. And, you know, it's not an easy problem because, right, if, if you have like 30 agrochemicals, you know how you can't possibly like test all of them at once. I mean, uh, you, you the the experiments get really complicated. Uh, you know, what, doing experiments on a single pesticide is complicated enough. Then you had two. Then it just multiplies that amount of time and effort and money. Uh, but it, we're some we're certainly something that we're concerned about. Uh, we're going to pu publish the preliminary list of pesticides found in in Ontario, Quebec, uh, Manitoba. Alberta and uh, British Columbia uh, very soon on our website, bcsi.ca. And there's going to be a much fuller analysis about uh, it's the potential impact of all of these pesticides on, uh, on, on bee health that will hopefully be published later in the year. Uh, certainly an area of, of concern. Uh, again, not a lot of answers, but uh, in logic dictates that if, you, you know, if you're going to expose a colony to like 30 different things, you're going to have at least a couple of like negative interactions that are that are uh, uh, reducing uh, the fitness of a colony. And then obviously these processes could also be happening in, in native bees as well, because yeah, native bees are also exposed to a large number of pesticides. One final question, because uh, we are out of time here, Dr. Kola. Uh, there was a project in the works to reintroduce the rusty patch. Is there something that is still being considered on this front? Yeah, for sure. It's kind of like a 10 year or longer project at the moment. Uh, so right now there are a few rusty patch bumblebee populations in Wisconsin, um, Minnesota, Illinois. And in fact, the, the one in Minnesota is, occurs at the Minneapolis Zoo, like on the zoo property. And they're one of the leading zoos for captive breeding and reintroduction for conservation purposes. Uh, so literally like two weeks before the pandemic hit, I was in Minnesota um, with my colleagues there. And actually one of the ones um, started talking, was talking about diseases and 
and bees and how we needed to think about this with the rusty patch, but mentioned uh, COVID and we were all like, what is he talking about? But anyway, um, <laughs> and then it changed everything. Um, but anyway, so that meeting was around trying to figure out what the knowledge gaps are for us to be able to do that, um, to start captive breeding in these places where the rusty patch still exists and then to reintroduce them into um, good quality habitat in places that it used to exist. So that'll mean recreating some of the habitats, restoring some of the flowering plants, making sure there's like not a ton of managed bees around that might spread diseases, um, thinking about future climate scenarios as well, and whether it's worth um, the efforts in certain areas um, based on the predictions. Um, so it's a really large collaborative work and we're definitely working on it, but it's gonna be quite some time before we get to it. Well, an exciting project to be a part of. So we look forward to hearing about uh, how this turns out in the years to come, hopefully. So that is uh, unfortunately it for our Q&A session for today. I wanna thank both of you, Sheila and Amro, for uh, sharing your expertise with us and uh, really giving uh, everyone an opportunity to have this conversation about bees just, just before World Bee Day. Uh, so I'd like to, at this point, turn it over to Joanne, who's going to, uh, finish off today's event with the final remarks. Joanne? Thank you so much. What a great conversation. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Kola and Dr. Zaid for uh, sharing your uh, research. And also thank you, Carolyn, for hosting such a lively Q&A. Um, you're all welcome now to turn off your video. Um, so to learn more about this research, please visit the website for the Center for Bee Ecology, Evolution and Conservation at York. Uh, and the website is yorku.ca slash bees. For those of you who would like to share today's session with family and friends, it will be posted onto the our, uh, YouTube page, which will be youtube.com slash YorkU alumni. You can also watch past lectures you may have missed as well. We have one final poll question for you that will pop up on your screen. How would you rate your knowledge of today's topic following our discussion today? Give a few seconds to uh, add in your selection for the poll. And let's see where we're at. Oh. Are the results going to show? Um, all right. Uh, well, I am glad you were able to join us today. And uh, definitely, um, our, I wanted to share information about our next Scholars Hub at Home session, which will be taking place on June 8th in time for Pride Month. It is titled Pandemic Possibilities, Sexuality, Gender and Youth in the Time of COVID with Jen Gilbert, Professor at the Faculty of Education. Register and learn more at yorku.ca slash alumni and friends. And thank you all. Be well. Happy World Bee Day and the long weekend ahead.